My name is John Mollison, and I'm with Old Guys on the Airplanes. And on behalf of the Distinguished Flying Cross Society and watch parties all across the country, welcome to debrief number six with Vietnam War POW, Colonel Robert Certain. I got three things I'd like to start out with. The first is we're going to begin the program with a little film. It's about 12 minutes long, and it's going to give you a great background on Colonel Certain's combat career as also his post-combat career. The other thing is that there's a number on the screen right now. Please don't call it. Instead, text me. That gets me questions, and I will ask them of Colonel Certain. The last thing I'd like you to know is there's also a website that I'd like you to, like you to keep in reference. It's www.dfcsociety.org. Look for the Teachers and Educators tab. And on there, you'll find a download that'll look something like this. It's an educator's kit that's got maps and graphics and photos and even a worksheet that's great for the classroom as well as the boardroom. And these things will also help you uh, get your mind around Colonel Certain's surface, but also may inspire a question or two. So let's get to the film, and when we're done, we'll start the live Q&A. There are people who believe that for the United States, Operation Linebacker II was the most powerful moment in the Vietnam War. If you've never heard of it, let me give you the gist. In December of 1972, President Richard Nixon ordered a series of bombing strikes in North Vietnam. And the purpose was to send the message. We're serious, we have the power, and we have the resolve to finally end this thing. And it worked. <laughs> you should check it out, but I have to warn you. The ultimate battlefield of winning or losing a war isn't land, it isn't sea, it isn't sky, and it isn't even outer space. It's the human soul. I'd like to introduce you to Colonel Robert Certain. As a navigator, he directed a most powerful weapon, the B-52G Stratofortress. As a warrior, he flew against the most heavily defended targets on Earth, Hanoi, North Vietnam. As a casualty, he was shot down and he became a prisoner. And then after the war, as a calling, he became an Episcopal priest. And then, as a human being, he went back to war to face the greatest challenge of all, the battle within. We drove out to the flight line and saw every airplane being loaded with bombs and fuel. That's when we knew this was big, and we were so ready to get this war over with. Linebacker 2 was a massive effort with B-52s and hundreds of other aircraft to bomb targets in the vicinity of Hanoi, North Vietnam, in order to force the North Vietnamese government to come back to Paris and, and agree to a peace treaty that they had tentatively agreed to in October. At that time, Hanoi was probably as heavily defended as Moscow with surface air missiles. And we were briefed on that first night, first morning before we took off, that we could expect a shoot down rate of about 10%, but there's no search and rescue. And so if you do get shot down, you're on your own. Target was a railroad yard on the northeast corner of Hanoi. We were on target, on time, on altitude, and we were in a lethal SAM area, but, 
But but the bomb at the EW says, Pilot, I don't have any threats. Only thing I'm showing on my scope is 100 millimeter AAA and search. They don't, they're locked on and we're too half to worry about them. So he opened the bomb bay doors. Five seconds later, I started to stopwatch this back up just in case something goes wrong. And two or three seconds later, the radar went off, shut down. And I thought, dang. And almost immediately the co-pilot started yelling, they've got the pilot, they've got the pilot. And the electronic warfare officer was calling, is anybody alive, is anybody alive? I looked over my left shoulder, there's a porthole and a door into the forward wheel well, right behind my position. And there was a blazing fire in there. Motion of the bombardier to get the bombs out, we dropped the bombs. Takes a tenth of a second to leave the airplane. My first thought was, well, I'm going to be a prisoner of war. Because that's just the way it's going to be. The free fall from 35,000 feet to 15, where the parachute begins to open, takes a couple of minutes. And when the parachute opened, I was hanging over the target. And when I looked down, I could see bombs blowing up between my feet. I saw this series of explosions. I thought, no, oh, I'm drifting right towards another target. And I said, and I, when I spotted the fire, the explosions, it was, it was arrow shaped. So that's when my airplane hit the ground. I touched down, rolled into the ditch, and I took off down the ditch in a low crawl. Uh, and because with a plowed field, I could see heads coming my way. And so I'm gonna get, there was a road down the way and a culvert underneath it. And I was gonna to try to get in there and hide, uh, but I didn't get that far. Four militiamen with AK-47s were in the crowd. Uh, they spotted me, I got up, surrendered. They brought me up on the railroad tracks basically took my clothes, blindfolded me, roped me, walked me into first one village and two or three others. Came around a curve at one point and there was a mound of dirt off to the right and uh, it looked like a firing gallery. I thought, okay, they're gonna shoot me here. They did, kept going. Once we got on the, in the vehicle heading in towards Hanoi, got to the Hilton, and I thought, now we're safe. I wonder what it would have been like had uh, one of these guys gotten shot down over Blyville, Arkansas. I wonder if they would have made it into a prison. You know, I thought, okay, this is their country. They're not thrilled that we're bombing their country. We are the enemy. I didn't know what to expect, being the first B-52 crew member to be captured. What I anticipated was it'd be much worse than I experienced. There were two B-52s with partial crews captured by the morning of the 19th. Two off of my crew. Bombardier was still out hiding. And then uh, four off of the Rose One. And so they called the International Press Corps in town to, to a news conference. And when I was led into this room, uh, I saw all these Europeans with cameras. And I thought, I'm going home. So I stood there in front of a bank of microphones and I look at every one of those cameras so that everybody would get a good shot of my face and my profiles. This picture makes me look very sad. And mm -hmm. what I was feeling was great joy. I was seeing all those Europeans with all those cameras thinking, I'm going home. They're not going to kill me now because my picture's going out. The bombing ended the end of December. The middle of January, they told us the treaty's been signed. Releases would start in two weeks on a Saturday and then every other Saturday through the end of March. The longest held prisoners of war were men of deep faith. They'd been through the dark night of the soul, 
and had come out on the other side. Then there's a middle group that had gotten as far as the dark night of the soul but hadn't resolved it yet. And then there were us new guys that were right at the tail end under a year. Uh, so there was no immediate observation of how the war would have affected us. That came later uh, when we discovered our responses to some things was probably not the best in the world. Do you think you have PTSD now? D? Not D. D. You're not D. You have post-traumatic stress. I have, I have post-traumatic stress responses and reactions. Yeah. Anybody that goes through a traumatic experience is going to have post-traumatic stress. This, the D stands for dysfunction. I, I would have some, let's say, anger management issues that I didn't even recognize. Veterans don't like to talk to people who haven't been there. And so they clam up. And if you hold it in, sooner or later it's going to come out in ways that you don't want it to come out. The three years I was in seminary, I was never asked one time by anybody on the faculty to, if, to talk about the experience. So I think it's important for all of us to come back and, and, uh, and try to put, put it into a perspective that makes sense and doesn't keep us imprisoned. At 15 was when I first believed I was called to ordained ministry. Uh, but every experience I've had while I was rebelling against that idea and doing other things and, seek, and seeking other ways of, of living my life have all developed me into who I am. In the Episcopal Church, there's a prayer that, that has the phrase, in whose service is perfect freedom. Learning from the past, but not being stuck in the past. Claiming our experience as part of what, what makes us and develops us as individuals and as human beings. That gives us deeper and greater understanding for people who are going through tragedies and stresses and turmoil and their lives could be their jobs, it could be their schools, it could be their families. How do you use that to find how the hand of God is working in the world around you. Do yourself three favors. The first, dig into the Vietnam War. If you believe that history is nutritious, it'll enrich your professional, personal, social, and political smarts. And second, Remember Colonel Certain's example. Inner demons can and must be tamed, but you're gonna to have to trust those you love the most. But third, if you really wanna get a benefit from history, write this one down on paper. If not, write it into your soul. It's this. Show deference to your elders because they contain the memory of who you are. Colonel Certain, this is your debrief. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first questions that we got was that uh, question about your Vietnam War experience, but they wanted to know about the experience you had before Linebacker 2. Now, that was Arclight, and you have 100 combat missions. So can you describe what Arclight was all about and what you were doing in Vietnam before December 18th, 1972? Sure. Arclight uh, was the B-52 operations in Southeast Asia using uh, D and F models. Uh, the difference between that and the G is most notably the tall tail right. as opposed to the short tail. But uh, so D model bases would go over for six months and come back for six months. G and H model crews would then go over on a fill-in basis from time to time, uh, get trained up in a D model in, before, in California before going over. So in 1971, about six months after I became operational and certified for, for combat, 
uh, I was my crew was sent to Southeast Asia in a D model, uh, based at uh, Utapau, Thailand. Mm. Flew f- 50 missions out of Utapau. It just happened to be 50. That was not some kind of magic number. The magic number was a uh, no longer was there 179 day orders. We generally rotated back after about 140, and I happened to have had 50 missions, uh, and those were. Uh, in and out of Thailand, about a four-hour round trip. Then I came home, uh, got back on uh, combat status with G models, uh, flew an ORI, got married suddenly and in the heat of the moment. And uh, <laughs> and because uh, we were scheduled to get married in June of 72, and then in May, the wing was notified that we were moving to Andrew to Anderson Air Force Base on Guam on a Saturday, and I was on a Sunday. I was notified, so we moved up our wedding, got married on a Friday. My crew got canceled, and uh, so we were together about six weeks before my crew was then sent to to Guam, and we started flying combat. It just happened to be my 100th personal takeoff. Uh, when Linebacker 2 started, and I was not supposed to fly that day because that was the day my crew was supposed to go home. Right. Let's, uh, for the sake of the audience, uh, you were a navigator. Correct. Now, in, in doing research about B-52s, I've learned a lot the difference between the D and G, but there's a radar navigator, there's a navigator. Explain what the crew of, Rick, you want to call up uh, uh, screen number one? Now, that's your B-52 that right. we're looking at, and it's a G model. But tell us, uh, tell us who's on that airplane and what roles that they play. Okay. Uh, all the way through the, the various iterations of B-52 is a crew of six. Okay. A through F, the gunner actually had a cockpit on the tail end of that airplane. With Gs, they moved a gunner to the front with the defense team of the electronic warfare officer who was a rated navigator, and the gunner, uh, the command team were the pilot and the co-pilot, mm-hmm. and downstairs in what we call the black hole was the offense team of the bombardier or radar navigator and the navigator. So you got three so, navigators. So I have three rated navigators, that's correct. Why do you need three navigators? To tell two pilots where to go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, because, because the, the airplane is pretty complex and the mission is complex, so the the one navigator who was the electronic warfare officer was in charge of defense, electronic defense, jamming any signals that, that were searching for us, dropping chaff and flares for to confuse radars and heat-seeking missiles. The gunner was, was part of the defense team to shoot at any uh, enemy aircraft that tried to get behind us to shoot us down. Then the navigator's job was to to fly to na- navigate the aircraft, and it was pretty, by today's standards, pretty crude. Uh, celestial navigation yeah. was most of it. Some map reading if we were over land, uh, and but mostly celestial, looking at the stars or the sun uh, to find our position o- over the Earth. And then the bombardier's specialized job was to get crosshairs on the target and get the bombs out. Okay. So we just got a question here. Celestial navigation. You know, I think about a guy on a ship with a sextant and looking at the stars. Is that right. what you did? Well, that's basically what we did. They actually, the electronic warfare officer would shoot celestial. We had a periscopic sextant with a periscope that went up through the top of the airplane. Uh, so it was held securely. And then I would calculate where he should find various stars uh, around the 360, uh, and he would take a two-minute shot of each one of those stars. I would then put them into mathematics and put them on the uh, and draw a line over the, the charts to where that star said we should be, and we would crosshatch three stars, and, when, and inside that triangle is where the airplane would be. Good grief. Now, if we, in daytime... That's a lot of work. It was a lot of work, and in daytime, like when we flew from Blyville, Arkansas to Guam... It was all day, right? And so we only could sh- the only star available was the sun, and right. we were chasing it across the sky because we were flying from from Arkansas to Guam, so flying west the whole day. It was sixteen hour day, wow! Because 
you know, the sun never set on us. Right. And, uh, and so that gave us a speed line, told us where we should be uh, longitudinally, and then we measured altitude with the radar navigator, could measure altitude over the ocean, and that gave us a course line because it told us whether we're flying into a low or a high, and then we had two lines to cross, and that's where we should be. So I think a lot of people, when they think about bombers, they get a picture of World War II, and they had B-17s, uh, and there'd be a, a bunch of them. You know, you could the film out the side of a window or something like that, and there'd be all the flat going off. Was that the kind of experience that you had in Vietnam? Was no. there s squadrons of B-52s going out? No. In, in Vietnam, we'd fly in what three-ship cell formation. And how close were you then? Uh, about a mile apart. So, okay, so going back to an arc light mission, and I think a lot of people have, who've seen the movie Apocalypse Now, there's a reference to arc light, and then they show what an arc light mission looked like on the ground. I mean, it was just it, devastating. Right. But these, so there wasn't a big swarm of B-52s. An arc light mission was three airplanes. And three airplanes. And a D-model airplane could carry um, 120, 500-pound bombs. And they could, the bombardier could set the equipment to, to space them like 500 to 1,000 feet apart. The lethal radius was 500 feet. Uh, 500 feet. And so uh, the, the number one airplane would go down the center of the track. Number two would be 500 feet to the left. Number three would be 500 feet to the right. And so they could cut a swath of total destruction f two miles long and 1,500 feet wide. And what would be your target in an arc light mission? Uh, largely for us, it was uh, truck parks, stacks of supplies, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We're trying to pulverize it so nobody could drive over it. Uh, sometimes troop emplacements for North Vietnamese or Viet Cong, uh, troop emplacements trying to take them out. I, I, you can only imagine that this had to be just absolutely terrifying for the enemy. Um, oh, yes. I got to sit on the ground for about 700 B-52 strikes in Hanoi in December of 1972, right. and I could understand well why they didn't like us very much. Right. So you are the navigator in these missions. What's going on? And we're still in 1971 here. Are you... Uh, how do you, how do you keep yourself from personalizing the target because you're you're carrying probably the most destructive power of any weapon in the Vietnam War? Did it occur to you that we are wiping out 1,500 feet by two miles? Well, mostly what what warriors do is to depersonalize whatever the target is, sure. whether it's people or equipment. If it's equipment, stacks of supplies, and trail markers and guides and that sort of thing, who cares? Uh, and so uh, we, we would not take the human toll in mind. One of the most difficult times that my crew had uh, and that I personally had was one day uh, on Guam, uh, we got a report. When we went in for a mission brief, we got a report of, of, an, of a South Vietnamese Army had gone into following a B-52 strike and counted bodies, like 150 or 250 uh, bodies that were accounted for and when they gave the day and the cell number uh, of the strike for that day then I knew that it was our crew yeah and that was a, a very quiet day for this crew we didn't carry on our usual banter we did our checklist we flew our mission we did our job but we were all pretty reflective about the the human toll of of war right so you do your arc light, uh, the arc light service, which is essentially, you said, 50 missions, and you go yes. home? right. And you get called back, and was that, that was that part of B Bullet Shot? That was Bullet Shot, correct. Yeah, in Bullet Shot, uh, just uh, summary on that, that's uh, the, the assembling of B-52s on Guam to equip for linebacker. Well, linebacker to, two. it was to do a number of things. It was mostly G model airplanes that were sent over for the first time. And we went to Anderson Air Force Base on Guam. Uh, and there were D models there also. So we had two wings, big wings, yeah. lots of airplanes. 
and and f at first we were we were uh, bombing cover for the final withdrawal of combat troops, U.S. combat troops from South Vietnam and Cambodia, and to to provide opportunity then for the Paris Peace Accords to move ahead uh, to get a uh, treaty agreed to by the U.S., uh, North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and the Viet Cong, uh, which was near completion in October of 72. Right. And then what happened? And then the presidential election happened in November of 72, and, uh, and, and I think the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, two things happened. South Vietnam balked at the treaty, uh, because it left North Vietnamese troops in place, uh, and so they were hesitant. But then, with the election, uh, the, the president lost both houses of Congress to the other party, and uh, and so you know the war was very unpopular in this country. And I think uh, the president was concerned that the Congress was going to cut off all funding when they met in January and that the POWs would be left in place for future negotiations. And the president didn't want that to happen. He wanted to get the POWs home. And that was President Nixon. President Richard Nixon, that's right. right. Right, and of course, we'll get to why President Nixon is so beloved or respected by POWs, but, so it's November uh, 1972. Did, did you, were you informed, did somebody call you in and say, you know, we're going to do some something different with bombing. We're going to decide to bomb North Vietnam. Because Arclight, you weren't bombing North Vietnam. That's you were correct. bombing South Vietnam. Correct. And Cambodia. So linebacker two, that was the first time B-52s ever went north, correct? Well, that far north. Okay. We had been north, but in the southern part of the, the narrow part of North Vietnam. And, uh, uh, but... I think it's so, somewhere in the fall, the, the, the commanders started getting word that to, to get ready for a major effort. The crews were clueless. We were just flying the line and doing our job. Uh, we, we were scheduled to rotate home on the 18th of December, and on the 15th, uh, all rotations were suspended. All missions with takeoffs on Saturday and Sunday were canceled, and all crews were told to go into crew rest. So there are only two possibilities. Either the war was over and we were taking our airplanes home, or something else was going to happen. Uh, right. So we went to, uh, well, that's when we grabbed a crew truck and drove out to the flight line to see what was going on. And when the and every B-52, even the hangar queens and the cannibalized birds had been put into, into operation. Right. And they were loading them all up and getting them ready for a mission. And so we knew it was going to be a max effort uh, to, uh, to do something really destructive to North Vietnam. Okay. Why do you think we didn't send B-52s into North Vietnam before? Why, why 1972 and why not 1966, 67, 65? Well, that, that was always a good question that we crew members asked. But, but part of the... The B-52s were part of the nuclear triad as part of the, the defense against the Soviet Union. Uh, and so uh, I think the Strategic Air Command didn't want to take a chance that B-52s would get shot down because it would have impaired our credibility with the Soviets and might embolden them uh, to start a nuclear war, uh, knowing that, that uh, they could defend against us. Uh, so I think they were really reluctant to uh, to uh, allow us to get into that kind of danger until President Nixon said, we're sending them. And do you think President Nixon had sending the POWs home as part of his strategy for bombing Hanoi? I mean, was that... Oh, well, I think all of us who became prisoners of war were pretty sure that was part of it. Right. And... When I talked to some of the old-time prisoners who were, had been there for several years, uh, when they uh, first saw my airplane coming down through the clouds on fire, uh, they were cheering and shouting and packing their mental bags uh, to go home because they knew if B-52s were coming to Hanoi, then the war was going to be over soon. Right. Rick, why don't you uh, put up 
uh, picture number seven. Now, this picture that we've got here is a takeoff of a B-52, and I, it right. was taken at Anderson. So you've, you're, it's December 18th. Now you know you're part of a big deal, linebacker two. Right. And you're going to take the war to the enemy with the most powerful weapon that we've got. I read your book, and it seemed like things started going wrong in your airplane <laughs> and the mission. And what is it? How many, aer- how many airplanes, how many B-52s were launched from Anderson? 60, maybe. 60? There's a lot. And that doesn't happen in half an hour. I mean, that's a big deal. No, we, even with minimum interval takeoffs, MITO takeoffs, uh, 30 seconds apart, that takes a while to get us all launched and out of there. Right. Um, and and plus, you know, the picture shows that black smoke. That's because we're, when we burn water, it it uh, we inject water into the yeah. jet engines. It turns that exhaust smoke really black, right. and the guys taken off behind two or three of those airplanes are taken off into darkness, right. and have to climb out and get away from it, go upwind in order to get away from it. But this mission was interesting. You called it snake bit. Snake bit. First first thing that happened was that uh, we had an earth tremor yeah. as we were taxiing out. <laughs> That's not a good sign. And then, and then uh, one of the rules of the day was that if you got a bad airplane, an airplane with a, medic- a problem that you couldn't fly, then that crew went to the tail end, picked up another airplane, and everybody else rolled forward one. <coughs> so we were scheduled as charcoal three. Then we became charcoal two, and that's the cell numbers. That's the, the cell, cell color was charcoal. Then the, the airplanes were one, two, and three. Okay. And so we became charcoal two. As we turned onto the active runway, we became charcoal one. And so I grabbed the navigator's kit, which was supposed to have had the flight plan <laughs> for the two cells in front of us, and instead it had the two cells behind us. So I tell the pilot, look, uh, we can't go any further north. We can't go any further forward. We have to stay at charcoal one for this mission, no matter what happens. Right. So that was beginning to be, okay, that's not good. The next thing that happened was as we got to the altitude where we pressurized the aircraft, it wouldn't pressurize. And so you need the pressurization because you because can't get above like 10,000 10, feet. 10,000 feet without it. So the bombardier pulled out the, the tech manual, and I pulled out mine, and we started looking for possibles. And uh, there were two <coughs> excuse me, air outflow valves that he went. First he crawled into the black hole underneath his feet and found one of them was, was propped open with a uh, coffee cup. And... It closed. When he took it out, it closed, and he it still didn't pressurize. Went upstairs, found the one upstairs, same issue. My guess, my first thought was somebody's trying to sabotage this deal, but probably there were so many maintenance people trying to do so much to get these airplanes going that when they were testing it, uh, they had propped it open temporarily and forgot in the, in the rush. And so we, so we pressurized and got going. So we cruise along for a while. We get over towards the Philippines. We're to rendezvous with a KC-135 Strato tanker to pick up some fuel in flight. And, uh, and the, there was a beacon code that I was looking for. I was a, a 221. I can still see the two, two beacons here, two down here, and one down here. And so I called the tanker. I had him rotate that ba- beacon to standby. So it went off, came back on. I directed the pilot over to the airplane. But we were off his uh, starboard wing, and no matter what, the two pilots were talking to each other. They could, that guy in the tanker wouldn't go fast enough, so th- and we couldn't go slow enough to get behind him. And finally, the pilot said, I'm at the initial point for the, for the refueling track. I'm turning downwind. And I thought, oh, man. That's a bombardier. Give me 50 miles on the scope. And out there in the distance was the same beacon code. And we had rendezvoused with the wrong tanker because the navigator on that tanker had followed my instructions. So, so I said to the gunner, shoot him down when we pass him. But <laughs> I was just kidding. Um, <laughs> and so, so we had to catch up. And I'm leading nine airplanes. And so the two cells behind us are, are going to be 
rendezvousing with us in those tankers, and so we we had to get get that all those nine airplanes back up, get our yeah. fuel, and press on. So that was the next thing that happened. Then, as we crossed South Vietnam, we got to what was called a compression point, where we moved from uh, five mile intervals between airplanes to one. And the two cells behind us, those six airplanes, discovered they were, their flight plan called them for them to be at the same altitude in the same time at the compression point. Which would have been a collision. Would have been a massive collision of six airplanes. Right. And so they had to do some S-turns and wiggle around, and uh, we pushed our throttles up to get out of the fireball. And uh, they were able to, uh, to get into, into sync with us and get, get on the way. Now, on the, if you go to that uh, dfcsociety.org website and download the Educator's Kit, there's a little graphic of everything you described in there. And I really encourage people to do this because you designed this graphic. I mean, you've plotted out your way across from Anderson. So what I want to do is I want to follow you up until that last turn into North Vietnam when you know now you're, cro you're, you're in Laos and you're crossing into North Vietnam, and now it's real. And you, where you're, you're on the western edge of North Vietnam, mm -hmm. you're making your turn, you're 15 minutes away from the target, and you're getting set up, and what's happening? Well, a lot of things are happening. First of all, this, the D models out of Utapau were already there. Utapau, Thailand. Utapau, Thailand. They had gone in ahead of us. And so there, Sam calls. We were hearing Sam calls from the time we crossed into South Vietnam. Which are the missiles, the surface Russian, air missiles, yeah. right? And uh, and Red Crown and all these 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 threat calls. So the bombardier and I, as we approached the target area, the initial aiming point, had to turn off our outside radios so we could hear each other with checklists. And the final challenge was going to be that. When we turned on the, our bomb run, we were going to enter a jet stream with about a 120 knot tailwind. And my job was to make sure that we got to the target on time, not early, not late, but on time because the mutual jamming and the, the jamming that was provided by the Navy and the Air Force around us was dependent upon us keeping our schedule. Did you? You got there on time. Got there exactly on time. Okay. We're getting great questions, and everybody wants to know, so I'm going to have to accelerate here. Okay. And again, just go to the sure. dfcsociety.org and get the educator's kit. But you're just seconds from jettisoning all those bombs on, the, uh, on your target, which was a rail yard, correct? correct? You're just seconds. Quickly, what happened? Well, it, we opened the bound bay doors at 15 seconds to go because we didn't want those things open because it makes the airplane just shine on the radar. And then at 10 seconds to go on the bomb run, we were wired. It was going to be perfect. The equipment was outstanding. I started a stopwatch just in case something bad happened and that, and that we lost something. And soon after I had started the stopwatch, the radar shut down, as it says in the video, uh, because we'd just been hit by the first of two surface air missiles. And the miss missiles don't hit airplanes. Missiles blow up close to airplanes. Right. And shrapnel, big pieces, chunks of metal come screaming at you at 1,800 feet per second and tear through the airplane. Uh, jet engines, if they go into a jet engine, it destroys the engine. Uh, it cut through mortally wounded at least two of our crew members, the pilot and the gunner. Uh, started a fire in the forward wheel well, started fires in the wings, knocked out engines, uh, and uh, so we had to now make an assessment. The first thing was uh, that we're on fire, and the fire is right in front of the bomb bay. Okay, so here's a question that is about the bombs on the airplane. So you got a, you've been hit, the plane's going down. Um, did you drop the bombs? Did you safety the bombs? Because you're, you're a big bomb. There are 750-pound bombs in yeah. that airplane, all inside the, the bomb bay. Because we couldn't guarantee they were going to hit the target, we safetyed the bombs and then draw, jettisoned them all at once. How, how soon did you, before the time you ejected? And Rick, would you put up a picture number four? How soon before you dropped the bombs and then you eject? 
Is that seconds? Part? A couple of seconds, probably. Because right. right after we dropped the bombs, I also realized that the fire in the forward wheel well was right below the main fuel tank in the middle of the yeah. airplane. It was time to jettison the airplane yeah. and get, get rid of it. And then you ejected, and uh, uh, we'll zip ahead here because there's a lot of questions that want to do, deal with uh, your uh, PTS issues. Okay. But you became a prisoner of war. Correct. And you realized now that you were captive. Did you have a, a sense of, I'm going to be here for a while? Did you have a sense of, oh, this will be here? Uh, well, I knew I was going to be a prisoner of war. Yeah. I didn't know how long. Uh, there were times when I thought I would only be a prisoner of war for a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. uh, but once we got into, into prison, I knew that I was going to be safe because the, the Air Force and the Navy knew where the prisons were. They weren't going to accidentally bomb it. Uh, and the day after, I was taken in front of the International Press Corps and shown off because they had six of us, two from my crew and four from another crew, and they were showing us off to the International Press Corps. Right. And when I saw all those Europeans with cameras, uh, then I, that's when I knew, at least I'm going to survive this. Right. I don't know how long I'll be here, but they would have some explaining to do if I didn't show up at the end of the day. Right. But that wasn't your treatment. Uh, you considered yourself a late war POW. And, uh, yeah. and then these other guys are, you, the POW community it seems like there's a division between the guys who went through a lot worse and you newcomers. Help, help me understand that. Well, there, were, there was a, the, what we call the Johnson bombing halt at one point. The guys who were down before the bombing halt uh, were tortured mercilessly by the North Vietnamese. All kinds of horrible things. Uh, and then after the, the bombing was restarted, there was a middle group. The treatment was a little bit better, but the real treatment really improved, according to Admiral Stockdale's book, In Love and War, the day after Ho Chi Minh died. Why do you think that is? Because I think he was behind it all. Mm -hmm. And so the new regime that came in uh, decided to stop the torture. Uh, there was some abuse, of course, but... Uh, nothing like what they had experienced prior to Ho Chi Minh's death. And so, so then the, uh, thus new guys who came in, particularly the December 72 guys, uh, they, were ready to, they were ready to sign a, a treaty. Right. All right. So it's March 29th, 1973. And there's a photo here. Rick, would you put up picture number six? Uh, you know, people think that I've photoshopped your hair, and it's not true. <laughs> no, that's why I couldn't escape and evade, is because I look like a traffic cone in the mm -hmm. full moon. But you're you're being you're at uh, um, Geelong Airport. That's Geelong Airport. I you see that's United States Air Force people around me. In the background are the North Vietnamese. So I had just walked across from an assembly point. Uh, after when my name was called, saluted the colonel at the table, reported for duty, mm -hmm. and then directed over to a C-141 uh, back ramp uh, where I would be loaded. I would walk on and then bu bu buckle in with the others and then we'd fly out of there to the Philippines. Okay, Rick, would you put up picture number 10? So this is a, a pretty cool photo. But I, I want to talk about your, your, your bride, Robbie. Now, this is a picture of you walking to your wife, arms outstretched. How did she handle the, your imprisonment? Well, she was not amused. Uh, you know, as I said, it was, I was due home that day. Yeah. And she had the house ready. It was Christmas. It was a week before Christmas. Uh, as the house was ready, it was her hometown. Uh, but so she was notified pretty quickly the next day that I was missing in action. But because of the fame of B-52 crew members being captured, uh, then within an hour or two, uh, they had confirmation that I was a prisoner of war. So she knew that. Yeah. And at Christmas, she was, she was with my family in Atlanta. And my brother arranged for them, the family to go to WSB television in Atlanta to watch the video of that uh, that news conference and so she was able to see that I could walk and I didn't talk I refused to talk to the cameras uh, but at why least is that? why because they wanted me to call for an end of the war 
it wanted me to call the, on the president to stop the bombing and to and to to say it was a terrible thing to be doing. I wasn't about to do that. But the bo the bombing in many ways worked. Yes, it did. Yeah. But the North Vietnamese didn't want it to continue right. any longer than possible. So uh, she is a, sc a school teacher, and uh, they had just gotten out for Christmas. And so she had some time to recover and to go to Atlanta to be with my family, see them, um, and, uh, and then await my return. And then every time there was a release, uh, she was called to say, I'm not on that flight until finally the last release I was. And we, after the few, few days in the Philippines to get uniforms and assignments, then we went to the medical center closest to our home, or where we came from, and so we went up to Scott Air Force Base in Illinois, and that's where that picture was taken as oh, okay. I landed there. And uh, she was there. My parents were there. My second grade teacher was there uh, who lived in St. Louis. You know, the, the uh, Vietnam War is tinged with this idea of, you know, regret and, and the veterans not, not being welcomed back. But just briefly, and then we've got to get to another topic because we're getting a lot of questions and we're running out of time, but that the POWs got the best welcome home. Yes, and, we did. Yeah. We really did. The, the, ground, the ground forces who came back throughout the war were treated shamelessly in this country uh, and basically hid uh, in order to get jobs and start their families and what have you. We were welcomed home with parades, with dinner at the White House, uh, with job offers, with lifelong passes to Major League Baseball, yeah. new cars, all kinds of things. Uh, and so we were mostly treated well. So, Rick, put up picture number nine. And I think this is the great segue. You now are Colonel Certain home, or not Colonel, but uh, you're still you a captain. A captain Certain. You got a, a bride and you got a beautiful baby. But for all the welcome home you got, there was still something going on. I mean, people want to talk about PTSD, PTSD, and, and that war damages you and all this stuff. And they want to hear the bad stories. But, and so when I look at this story, this picture, this is your new life. And Correct. yet, according to your book, it wasn't rosy. No, there were, there were times when I had nightmares and uh, I would tear, it would upset my wife wake her up uh it would sometimes they would even wake me up uh and so that went on for a while and and you know all of a lot of us were like pharaoh the king of the nile yeah <laughs> and so you know we said you know well, we're home we're this didn't bother us we get back with our lives i was in seminary uh and when that picture was taken uh and it was taken here at lackland air force base all right yeah. where our son was born and uh, uh, and so denying that, that it could have had an effect because I was a short-termer uh, in Vietnam and, uh, and I was on with another life and I was going to seminary and I was going to be an Episcopal priest. Uh, and so it, the effect of, of uh, what went on in Vietnam uh, varied over time. The, the most time it, where I was, I was sort of difficult to live with was between Thanksgiving and Easter. And I always said, well, that's just the, the way the Episcopal Church calendar works because we're very busy during the Christmas season and during Lent and, the Christ and Easter. And so it was lay people that were driving me nuts. Uh, and so I was home probably 20 years before I heard about anniversary stories and realized that Thanksgiving to Easter were the bookends of my imprisonment. I think today they call it a trigger warning. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that's when I, I started doing some personal uh, care things to, to do less work, delegate more, withdraw somewhat so that I would not be so impossible to live with. We, when, when we were doing our interview with um, for the film, you made it clear to me that veterans and, and combat warriors coming back, they're not broken people. 
And, you know, I think there's a conception that when you have PTSD, you're just, you're, you're broken. <laughs> but help, help us understand no. that. I mean, it, post-traumatic stress, uh, stress responses vary from growth. Yeah. You know, you get a lot of guys, you know, and I had some, a good bit, I think, of, of insight into people in difficult positions over which they have no power. Bad jobs, bad marriages, b bad diseases, car wrecks, home right. invasions, whatever. And, and, uh, and so you get some insight. And so I felt as a clergyman then, I could take the insight from my prison experience and understand people who were going through similarly themed events in their lives. Do you ever do you ever get cured of post traumatic stress? I don't know that I get ever get cured, but you learn to grow from it. And so the the most mostly I think in the media people focus on the D part, the dysfunction part. But there's personal growth that from personal insight. Then there's those bad behaviors or weird reactions that we don't understand and we stop and think about it and say, oh, this is related to once upon a time long, long ago. And so we make some change. And then there's further down the line is when our family or our friends take us aside and say, you're just really messing up and what's going on? And it forces you into a new insight. And then there's the dysfunction when psychotropic medications, psychologists and what have you can really help break the back of whatever it is that's causing you problems, and then you can grow beyond that. You know, I'm, I'm going to try to see if I can just go a little bit long, and uh, if I can, I know we don't have a whole lot of time to go over, but there's, uh, we're at the at, at the end of this, but there's a question that came up that is, uh, I think, very appropriate, and um, uh, I'm going to read it to you. I've been scanning these, but I'm going to read this uh, directly. Colonel Certain, is there anything about the evacuation of Saigon that we should have applied to the evacuation of Kabul in the past days. And the reason I bring this up is because we're in a sense of trauma right now in our country. As we hear these news headlines, and it just seems like failure and failure or uh, hurt and hurt and reeling in a, what is America anymore? Well, it's a, a lot of that denial was going on in Vietnam and that um, the ambassador at the time would not leave Saigon. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a, a preset plan for evacuating the, the American babies, the orphans that, of, of the soldiers uh, who had been left behind. We didn't have a plan for, for evacuating our allies. We, we convinced ourselves that the South Vietnam uh, military would be able to defend themselves, and ultimately they were not. Yeah. And we didn't do a better job in Afghanistan either. Uh, you know, that kind of a, of a movement out would have taken months if not years to schedule it and to stage it so that it didn't give discouragement to the to the nation we were leaving behind and did not put people in danger of of death well there's a, a phrase that old, old guys in airplanes like to say and that is history is nutritious and we got to do a better job teaching history and normally i'd have a, a nice close but all things considered air force chaplain and a leader in the Episcopal Church. Um, would you mind saying a prayer for our country, sir? Sure, I would, not, I would definitely not mind to do that. Yeah. Let us pray. Oh God, you made us in your own image. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. Soften the hearts of our enemies. Lead them and us from prejudice to truth. Deliver them and us from hatred, cruelty, and revenge. And in your good time, enable us all to stand reconciled before you, that all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. As we leave behind our mission in Afghanistan, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. In your most holy name we pray. Amen.